What's one of the largest, fastest growing social media platforms of all time? A tremendously growing company you'd think was making boatloads of money? A company that's gambling everything on whether it has a future in this age of online shopping? That's right, today we're looking at Pinterest. Hey everybody and welcome back to Dollars and Cents, helping you make sense of making dollars. Pinterest got its start like so many others by two guys looking to build a revolutionary media platform. Founders Ben Silberman and Paul Sciara were classmates at Yale and even worked at Google and Radius Labs respectively. They both quit and started Cold Brew Labs, creating a platform called Tote in 2009. Tote, however, was ahead of its time, allowing users to browse products from various retailers, maybe too ahead of its time. Since this was before the booming age of online shopping, Tote failed to garner a big enough audience to live and as a result, closed down altogether. This didn't stop Silberman and Skyara, they were convinced they could do better. Using the user data from Tote, the pair launched Pinterest in early 2010. It focused on the ability for its users to collect or pin interesting ideas to boards they could create. Whereas Tote failed, Pinterest exploded. From its official launch in March 2011, Pinterest quickly became one of the fastest growing online platforms to date. By December of that same year, the platform earned its place in the top 10 largest social networks and garnered 10 million unique users monthly in under one year. It evolved even further over the coming years, growing into the absolute behemoth it is today. New features were added constantly and eventually monetization was introduced. In 2015, the site hosted 50 million active users monthly and received hundreds of millions of dollars in venture funds. All this eventually led to Pinterest going public in mid-2019 at a $12 billion valuation. And this leads us to today and a dive into Pinterest's financial health. Please note that Pinterest is still relatively new as a public company, so I only have a few years worth of financial data to go on. However, it should be good enough to roughly gauge Pinterest and its financial health. Let's get into it. First up is revenue growth. In 2017, Pinterest managed to pull in $473 million dollars in revenue. By the end of last year, the company had more than tripled it to a massive $1.69 billion. I wager a lot of this was from the pandemic, yet even before 2020, Pinterest's revenue growth was pretty impressive. Second on our list is shares outstanding. I fully expect it to be going up, and it is. In 2017, Pinterest had just over 448 million shares outstanding. This number has jumped to 596 million, around a 30% increase in just four years. While it's unfortunate that Pinterest is diluting its shareholders, it makes sense given the stock's current high valuation. Free cash flow growth is next, and like Pinterest revenue, its free cash flow is also growing quite rapidly. In 2017, the company reported a loss of $144 million. At the close of 2020, Pinterest reported a first-time-ever positive free cash flow of $11.43 million. While good, keep in mind this may also be result of the pandemic boost. Following that, we have current assets versus current liabilities, with their current assets standing at $2.66 billion against $237 million in current liabilities. This all comes with an impressive $2.14 billion in cash. Much like its counterparts, Pinterest can pay off all of its outstanding current debts. In fact, Pinterest can pay off all of its total $381 million in debt. This is great because it means we can take a little off the market cap when looking at valuation. On that note, we need to talk about valuation. Listen, I understand that Pinterest is a company burning through cash to grow as fast as it has, but I don't think we can actually get an accurate valuation because of one reason. All Pinterest does is lose money. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but for right now we're just going to take last year's free cash flow as it's the only positive number and go from there. Like I stated earlier, Pinterest's free cash flow last year was $11.4 million. Multiply this by 20 and we get an expected market cap of $228 million. Right now, the market cap is $34 billion. So, just a little overpriced, but that's somewhat to be expected. Finally, let's look at ROIC and Pinterest dividends, or lack thereof. Last year, Pinterest return on invested capital was 9.6%, slightly lower than my 10% goal, but you should also take this number with a grain of salt. We don't have the 5-year average ROIC, 
easy and to be calculated accurately, the company actually has to turn a profit, and Pinterest can barely do that as it is. And also, for that reason, it's perfectly fine that Pinterest doesn't pay a dividend. Now that we've got a good idea about the company's finances, let's get into the meat of the video why you should or should not invest in Pinterest. Two important metrics you should pay attention to are monthly active users and average revenue per user. As Investor from Growth to Value points out in his write-up about Pinterest, social media companies are changing their focus from total users. Instead, it's about deriving the most profit from that user base, or as he calls it, Social Media 2.0. For the most part, I agree with many of his points. If anything, you should check out from Growth to Value's write-up for yourself. Link in the description. For a long time, Pinterest has also had this heavy focus on monthly active users or MAUs and built the best platform with the best features, not really focusing on monetizing those users. But that's changing. It seems Pinterest has started shifting away from MAUs to average revenue per user, and that's fairly evident from the company's recent earnings calls. Speaking of earnings calls, let's take a quick look through some of the highlights of Pinterest's most recent earnings call, quarter two of 2021. Compared to last year, Pinterest's monthly active users grew by 9% overall, with strong international growth coming in at 13%, and the 9% overall growth is weighted down by the 5% loss of its user base in the US. Although this is somewhat expected given the surge of activity on the platform in 2020. When it comes to the second metric average revenue per user though, Pinterest lags behind its competitors like Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat. Facebook's ARPU stands at an impressive $53.01 in the US. This comes with Snapchat at $7.37 and Twitter's hanging out right around $5.10. Compare this to the $5.08 in average revenue generated per user from Pinterest and we're not that far off but we are still lagging some of the major competitors. This average revenue per user is going up tremendously though. It actually increased for Pinterest with an impressive 89% overall growth, led by 163% international growth and 103% domestic growth. Pinterest has only somewhat optimized its international user base, driving only 36 cents per user. Again, in the US, Pinterest's ARPU is $5.08. Overall, combining international and domestic, that balances out to $1 and 32 cents in average revenue per user. With this apparent shift from gaining new users to increasing how much revenue the company can generate from its existing user base, Pinterest seems to be in a transitory phase. And that's really one of my main arguments for the company. So long as Pinterest can continue monetizing its users without losing too many of them, this unique platform could have a very strong future moving forward. Plus, it's that uniqueness from other social media platforms that really sets Pinterest apart. Founder Ben Silberman said the platform isn't really social media. He said if social media is about connecting with other people, Pinterest is about connecting to yourself. If you've used Pinterest, it's true. It's more so a platform where you can find and collect the things you like and explore new avenues, whether that's a new recipe, ideas for a party, or exposure to new travel destinations. And that's only the surface of it. Regardless, Pinterest allows you to explore and collect interesting things, or as Silberman also said, Pinterest is the place people go to make decisions about what to do next. Monetary growth, transition, and uniqueness are all great things for a platform like Pinterest, but I wouldn't bet the farm on this platform without seriously considering some of the major drawbacks. The first thing to consider is the possibility of a failure to execute. Up to this point, Pinterest has been killing it, adding new features and growing its user base tremendously, all led by its faithful founders. However, all it takes is for those devoted leaders to lose sight of what makes Pinterest great and unique. Then they become a value drain instead of a value add. How well, Pinterest has a dual class structure that allows Skyara and Silberman to retain majority control of the company and its decisions. They could decide to radically change the company and not much could be done to stop them. While it might be unlikely, it's not unprecedented in social media. Just remember Vine or MySpace and you'll get it. As a second point, Pinterest tends to fall short on expectations of monthly active user growth, prompting some to say the company is headed in a downwards direction. While true that Pinterest has faced some monthly active user problems, it's still grown by 9% overall. And again, I'll reiterate that those drops don't necessarily matter all that much as long as the company can continue to better monetize its user base. One more thing I want to mention before moving on is the abysmal average revenue
revenue per user for Pinterest international users. I'm not sure what's causing this, but they certainly burn through enough cash in R&D to hopefully figure it out. If you have any insight or ideas what might be throttling international ARPU, please tell me in the comments below. The last negative point that makes me wary of Pinterest is the ads. I feel like the site is becoming overrun with them. I understand this increase in ads is intentional, but it also runs the risk of becoming distasteful to its established user base. To illustrate this point, we're circling back to MySpace. At one point, MySpace was the largest social media platform to ever exist. It led the way in social media as a means to connect people all over the world, and many people actively used it. The platform was red hot and lucrative. MySpace was making deals left and right, even signing a $900 million ad deal with Google. But it wasn't just the poor management and increasing competition that crushed MySpace. It was all the ads, too. Soon, MySpace became even more flooded and overrun with rampant ads, on top of the already intrusive ads existing on the site. This toxic combination led to massive drops in user activity, and eventually to MySpace's ultimate demise. Really, I'm starting to feel this way about Pinterest, at least to me, with an admittedly limited experience on the site, that the prevalence of promoted pins seems too abundant. Although, I also admit, Pinterest managed to incorporate advertising in a seamless way that aligns with its platform structure. Ads are structured like pins, which makes them feel like you aren't being advertised to. Still, there's a lot of them. All that said, good and bad about Pinterest, I sold my position. It's just too overvalued for me right now. While Pinterest can certainly have an incredibly strong future ahead despite the millions it burns in development, I probably won't buy another share until the price hits around the $25 range. And that may seem like a steep drop, but just as it can have a bright future, Pinterest can take a grim turn like so many before it. If you found this video Pinteresting, leave your thoughts in the comments below or hop on my Discord, link in the description. Until next time, I will see all of you in the next episode of Dollars and Cents.